Welcome back, everybody. Time for Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntra is here. Today, an editorial addressing the current controversy over the creation of Wolverine. Uh, Roy Thomas has made a claim as a co-creator of Wolverine. Uh, it was long established fact that Len Wein and Herb Trimpey were long time listed as the writer and artist who created Wolverine for an Incredible Hulk issue from the 70s. And then of course Len went on to write the initial new X-Men stories that started with Giant X-Men number one. Well, we all heard the news this week that uh, Disney and Marvel have decided that Roy Thomas should be listed as a co-creator of War, War, uh, Wolverine. Uh, Len's widow has been uh, made uh, public of the fact, and apparently it's going to be in the screen credits. And not only that, but there likely will be compensation uh, for Roy uh, for creating, co-creating uh, Wolverine. Is it just? I will let you decide. You will hear my editorial in a moment, and then you will hear a conversation with Dr. Susanna Flores, Roy Thomas and myself after Len's death uh, in 2018 when Dr. Flores wrote a book called The Psychology of Wolverine and you will hear Roy uh, give his reasons of uh, or his you know and again just in conversation of why he uh, feels he's a co-creator of Wolverine as well it was the first I had ever heard of it but uh, like I said I know this is kind of a big story right now and I think it is an either uh, a very binary either you agree with Roy or you don't, I think there are a lot of shades of gray. I explain more in my editorial, but that's the uh, that's the subject for today's episode of Word Balloon, and I hope you'll enjoy it. Word Balloon is brought to you by AlexRossArt.com. Alex is a good friend of the show, and uh, I am uh, honored that uh, he aligns himself with Word Balloon, and uh, good Lord, we all love his iconic art, uh, whether it's for DC, Marvel, Things like Monty Python, The Monkees, David Bowie, so many other great uh, licensed things, The Beatles. Uh, if you go to alexrossart.com, you will find great value for your dollar, whether you can uh, spring for uh, something like uh, original cover art or uh, pages to lithos and posters, every price point you can imagine, you will find something and a beautiful image from alexrossart.com. Coming to Kickstarter from the mind of Franco, the man behind Teen Titans Go to the Library, Faye of the Moon, and All Yeah Comics, comes the new LXT, the adversarial fighting card game, live now on Kickstarter. LXT, Lux vs. Tenebris. Imagine a loved one has been spirited away to a land of terror and torture. Would you be willing to go after them and fight through a horde of acolytes of the Dark One just to get them back? Developed as a role-playing card game that can be played multiple ways. The cards will have full-color illustrations on the front and chock-full of steps and moves on the back. You can also get the LXT Who's Who book with origin stories and information about all the characters. Still want more? Also available is the LXT Dark Atlas book, filled with pro stories about all the baddies and illustrations from a wide selection of comic artists. There are plenty of add-ons you can purchase separately like comic books, stickers, original art from the game, and more. It's going to be a howling good time. LXT, live, now on Kickstarter. Word Balloon brought to you by my league of Word Balloon listeners. That's right, uh, my financial backers of uh, what I'm trying to do here. Uh, it's pretty simple, everybody. Word Balloon is free. It'll always be free. But I could sure use your financial help. If you've ever thought about uh, subscribing to Word Balloon, I certainly would appreciate it. Uh, now, is Word Balloon worth the price of a comic book a month? Is it even worth a dollar a month? If you think so, if you can swing it, I sure would appreciate your support. All I try to do is bring you fantastic content, uh, talking to some of the greats of pop culture. Consider subscribing to Word Balloon by going to my Patreon, patreon.com slash word balloon thank you very much for your support league of word balloon listeners hi everybody welcome back it's word balloon the comic book conversation show john suntress here presenting a conversation that happened at terrificon back in 2018 the reason why i'm representing it is uh certainly in the last week uh we all found out if you pay attention to comic book sites like bleeding cool and others that uh it has come out that uh, Disney and Marvel 
are going to now list Roy Thomas as a co-creator of the character Wolverine. Now, this is a complicated issue. We all know that Len Wein wrote uh, the Hulk issue that Wolverine first appeared in. Herb Trimpey drew that issue. We also learned, uh, because uh, people were honest, that John Romita Sr. De uh, designed the original Wolverine costume. And through the years, I think slowly, uh, Roy Thomas has been uh, demonstrative about asserting that he is a co-creator of Wolverine. He has said in the past, uh, for years now, that the concept started with him. Uh, he presented the problem to Len Wein and said, I want to introduce a Canadian character. I want him to be animal-based. I think a Wolverine is a fierce creature to base him on. Go write the script. But Roy has always been very earnest in the past about that Len really did the heavy lifting when it came to the writing of Wolverine's character. Certainly further developed in X-Men, Giant Size X-Men number one, as Wolverine joined the team. And, uh, you know, we learn more and more about uh, Logan in the ensuing years. I say this as a complicated question because I have certainly read and heard and seen, whether it's a podcast or a video cast, and some articles that people are obviously a little upset for the memory of Len Wein, for his widow. Um, God, I remember that wonderful moment uh, at the red carpet of Logan where Hugh Jackman, the star of the Wolverine uh, films of the uh, 20th Century Fox movies, including Logan, had Len stand up and said, I would not be here today if it were not for this man, Len Wein. And Len got a well-deserved round of applause. Everyone has always acknowledged that Len is the written creator of Wolverine. And again, kind of a little Herb Trip, you know, Herb Trippy again uh, drew that first appearance in Hulk. And uh, Ramita Sr. got his credit for, well, he designed the character. He designed all that. Uh, they made his claws adamantium. And you can say that Roy uh, created uh, and the idea of the metal adamantium. But I don't know. I really, I honestly don't know. I wasn't there. And sadly, Len is not here to not only defend himself, but perhaps share the credit with Roy and say, well, yeah, that's true. You know, Roy, Roy uh, did kind of give me the initial guidelines of what he was looking for. But I really think if there's a pecking order, and I think most comic book fans who know comic book history would agree, that I would say uh, Len is first, then her Trippy, then John Romita Sr., and finally Roy Thomas. So if you want to list co-creators. Sadly, these other three people aren't with us anymore. You know, John just died uh, last year, and... Um, Herb died a few years ago, and poor Len died a few years ago. Len was in tough health. And I'm really glad that Marvel uh, did right by Len and uh, gave him a nice fat paycheck uh, near the end of his life as a thank you. Um, this current controversy reminds me of... It wasn't a controversy, but the, it's kind of murky. If you go back to the Silver Age and you say, well, who created the Barry Allen version of of the flash julie schwartz the editor of showcase uh said i want a new version of the flash an updated version uh john broom wrote the story carmine infantino drew the story and again um is julie's involvement in the creating barry allen along the same lines as roy thomas when it comes to uh, wolverine i don't know i really don't know i wasn't there we weren't there in uh in the 70s for the creation of Wolverine when they were making that Hulk issue. And sadly, Roy is the only man living that can give his side of the story. But again, we don't get Len's side. So I don't doubt that Roy uh, had a hand in creating Wolverine, but it does kind of bother me that uh, he has gone to the length of claiming uh, full co-credit rights. Apparently, according to uh, Disney and Marvel... Roy will be listed as a co-creator on the credits of uh, the upcoming Deadpool Wolverine movie. Uh, he will get some sort of compensation. I don't know what the amount was. It could be a six-figure sum, possibly. It could be a four-figure sum. I remember Ed Brubaker only getting $5,000 for creating the concept of the Winter Soldier in Captain America Winter Soldier, but in the comics first... Uh, Winter Soldier arguably is the best, I think, solo 
Marvel movie of uh, the current Marvel era, and it's certainly my favorite, and I know it's a lot of other people's, and uh, we all feel like it got gypped. I also know that the laundry list of Roy Thomas characters uh, is certainly impressive of uh, the various people, and you can look up online uh, the other great characters. In fact, in the conversation with uh, Roy and his um, co-panelist Susanna Flores that I'm going to present later, I list a bunch of uh, other creations by Roy. By the way, including Ultron, Age of Ultron. Well, you know, I bet Roy got a check for that. But I wonder if, like a lot of other Silver Age and Bronze Age uh, creators who have had to remind the parent companies, uh, by the way, I did create this and deserve some sort of compensation, it might be small. Like I said, it might only be four figures. I really don't know. Uh, I know of creators from DC and Marvel that when these characters have been exploited in television, uh, the checks aren't huge, but uh, in some cases recurring. I know in the Supergirl TV series, a guy like Jerry Ordway got, you know, a decent uh, check, uh, um, some sort of residual. It wasn't life-changing, but it certainly was helpful added income. And again, these are my words, not Jerry's. But based on my conversations with Jerry, both on and off the air, I can say that. Um, I Again, I'm shaking my head right now, and I'm really speaking extemporaneously. I don't know. And I, it does kind of bother me that uh, Len Wein's widow has to share uh, money with Roy. But then again, maybe Disney saw this as like, all right, let's catch up with our money that we probably owe more, a Roy for the many characters that he created from the Marvel Universe that have been and likely in the future will be exploited in uh, Disney uh, TV shows and movies. Um, maybe there's some of that in this um, agreement. Uh, what also really bothers me is I know that a man that represents Roy these days and has been for many years, almost 10 years as far as I know, um, <sighs> I'm not going to name him. You can find out if you really want to hunt around and, and read some of the articles. You'll get his name. Not a fan of this guy. And frankly, I think is an opportunist that is likely getting a slice of whatever Roy is going to get. Again, I don't mean to mitigate Roy's amazing contributions to Marvel, amazing contributions to DC as well. Roy is a great writer on his own and a guy just like all these other Silver and Bronze Age guys that are still around. Hey, if you're going to exploit their stuff in films or in TV, uh, they deserve a check. And they deserve a healthy check. And, uh, I mean, again, think of the multi-millions uh, that uh, DC has made from the creation of Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster when it comes to Superman. Think of all the money that came from... And you got to give Bob Kane a little credit, but you better throw in Jerry Robinson and Bill Finger, too, when it comes to Batman and Robin and the Joker and all the Batman mythos that Bill Finger and Jerry Robinson... Uh, majorly contributed to uh, alongside Bob Kane's initial idea. Um, you know, these guys deserve and their estates deserve to be paid. I think we all agree on that. I'm Again, I'm so conflicted about this. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to present this episode, which um, not only uh, has this conversation between myself, uh, Dr. Susanna Flores, who wrote a book called The Psychology of Wolverine, and uh, Roy himself, uh, because you'll you'll get Roy's side of the story uh, in his own words. Back in 2018, six years ago, um, I wish Len were around to kind of raise his hand and say, well, yes, but, or no, I think Roy, you know, again, the original idea started with Roy, and I executed it, but no, I would consider uh, Roy a co-creator as well. Roy, uh, Man, Len was such a gracious guy. Uh, you know, I don't know. But regardless, I know Roy's representation is rather uh, forceful. And I think he kind of laid the carpet for this uh, a couple of years ago. And has likely been hounding uh, Marvel and Disney about this fact. Especially knowing uh, after Logan that uh, they were going to come back with at least one more uh, Wolverine movie. The likelihood is, as Marvel and Disney move forward... Wolverine will be recast as the X-Men enter the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and we'll get another uh, Wolverine. Roy's in his 80s. 
I don't know how I, this gravy train won't, you know, I don't know. I don't know how it was set up. I don't know if uh, Roy's wife or uh, if Roy has children, if there will be an estate and they will continue to uh, get compensated for uh, for Wolverine in the same way that Jack Kirby's grandchildren uh, got a nice uh, settlement. I don't know if they get ongoing payment for the use of Kirby characters in Marvel movies and TV. Um, I do remember reading years ago, and I'm sure you can find online, how Stan Lee was compensated uh, beyond his death. And his wife Joan uh, made money for a long time. His daughter also made money for a reasonable amount of time. Um, again, I don't want to see these Bronze Age and Silver Age creators screwed the way that Siegel and Schuster were. Um, I don't know. I really, I really don't know. So uh, to uh, get more into this, I'm going to present now this uh, great conversation between Roy Thomas, Susanna Flores, and myself. It happened at Terrificon back in 2018. Uh, judge for yourself. And, and again, I can appreciate the binary society we live in, that everything is black and white. I think there are a lot of shades of gray when it comes to uh, the creation of Wolverine and again, I can see an argument where Roy might deserve some credit, but I still, at the end of the day, think Len and uh, Herb Trimpey deserve a hell of a lot more. So my, again, my pecking order would be Len Wein, Herb Trimpey, John Romita Sr., then Roy Thomas. You know, that role of an editor, what, it, what does it mean? How involved was Roy uh, beyond what we've heard as far as these are the cues, and then go make it. There are quotes that are all over the place uh, from both Len Wein and Roy Thomas in the past, uh, some in a very humble way in Roy's part to say that Len did the heavy lifting. Um, I don't know. I really, really don't know. So as further am am ammunition to judge for yourself, I wish I had a conversation with myself and Len. I only had a very brief convention floor conversation with Len about 15 years ago, and frankly, I was really focused on what he was doing currently, which was DC Animation, and he did a Batman Superman annual where it was a new story with that crazy villain, the composite Superman, that was on one side of his body, Superman, on the other side of his body, Batman. One of my favorite goofy Silver Age origins, uh, but that's what Len and I talked about on the record. Um, I had a, several encounters with Len, including at his last San Diego, and man, that poor guy. I was so glad he was in a wheelchair. He he just he looked like he was dying. I, I don't mean to be rude, but it was wonderful, and I shook his hand, and I said, and I knew how much events like Comic Con meant to Len, and it had to be just a positive tonic of experience for Len to be at that last Comic Con. And I'm like, Len, we're all so glad you're here. And he smiled and shook my hand, and yeah, it was tough. It was it really was bittersweet. So I'm glad I got to say goodbye to Len uh, without actually saying it. But you know, sadly, we all kind of knew the end was near. Anyway, um, this is Easter Sunday when I'm recording this uh, intro, and uh, I don't know. I really don't know. I don't know if uh, fan backlash will cause Disney to make any subtle changes to the agreement again given uh, Roy's body of work and contributions to Marvel that were extensive and should not be denied, uh, if, if it's like a kind of culmination of payback of, yeah, you know, kind of like Kirby and the Kirby um, grandchildren, you know, maybe we owe, we owe this creator more than whatever we initially paid him for the times that the Vision and Ultron have been used in Avenger movies. I really don't know. So, a little more grist for the mill from the Word Balloon perspective in this conversation with Dr. Susanna Flores and Len, uh, Roy Thomas, sadly not Len Wein. I wonder what Len was thinking from heaven as he was watching this conversation. Was he shaking his fist? Was he nodding along? None of us will know. But here is that conversation from Terrificon back in 2018, now on Word Balloon. My name is John Suntress. I host a podcast called Word Balloon, and one of our panelists has actually been on the podcast, but I'm very excited to be here today for the psychology of Wolverine, and uh, this is going to be great because uh, let's get really into the psychology, the psychoses of Logan, 
a very complicated character that uh, started with this gentleman, uh, Roy Thomas, a legendary comic book writer and editor who was Stan Lee's first successor as, as editor-in-chief of Marvel Comics. He's known for co-creating some of comics' greatest characters, such as Wolverine, Carol Danvers, Morbius, The Vision, Iron Fist, and Ultron. He introduced the pulp magazine heroes Conan and Red Sonja, along with the sci-fi fantasy Star Wars, to Marvel Comics. How about that? Also, um, Roy has had lengthy writing stints on Marvel's X-Men and Avengers, and at DC Comics, the All-Star Squadron, and Infinity Incorporated, among many other titles, books, and a couple of movies, like Fire and Ice. Big fan. Yeah. Right? You're the guy that saw that, right? Oh, I got it on DVD. Come on, man. Yeah. In, uh, in 2011, he was inducted into the Will Eisner Comic Book Hall of Fame and currently edits the comic history magazine that I get every time there's a new issue, Alter Ego, and also works with Stan Lee on the Spider-Man newspaper strip. Mr. Roy Thomas, ladies and gentlemen. And also joining us, and forgive me, psychiatrist or psychologist? Psychologist. Psychologist, thank you. I know there's a distinction. Yeah, if I could prescribe medications, I'd be way more popular. We'll have to talk about that. <laughs> All right, that's good to know. <laughs> who, who wrote The Psychology of Wolverine? Dr. Susanna Flores. So, Dr. Flores. <laughs> so, this is, man, uh, I think you picked a pretty complex person, character. To, to write a book about Suzanne, so Susanna. So tell me, yeah, tell me about what intrigued you about writing a book about Wolverine. Well, to be um, very forthcoming, um, I, I, I was not raised a geek. I recently became one, and I'm in. Now that I'm in, I'm in. Um, cool. It, it occurred a, a few years ago um, to uh, during a time when I was sexually assaulted. And I'm putting it out there because it's an important topic to talk about. And um, you know, a lot of people assume that psychologists that you know we don't experience the same level of trauma as other people just because we understand human behavior. And I'm here as witness to tell you that it's absolutely not the case. Um, during that time, it was very uh, difficult for several reasons, not just the trauma, but also um, the judgment from society and the experience firsthand how people love to blame the victim. And I just felt numb. I think that was the worst part, is the numbing. Because before then, I was like South Side of Chicago girl. I was in a tough, opinionated, in your face if I needed to be, and I lost myself completely. Um, and then I ran across a panel of um, Wolverine from the Dark Phoenix side on, where the Hellfire Club. And he's in the gutter, and he's covered in dung, and he um, beaten in battle. And uh, still, he had his, you know, adamantium claws out, right? And then I, it was the sneer, right? The sneer, you know, <laughs> of I'm going to get them back, right? Like, you've taken your best shot, suckers, and now it's my turn. And something just kept bringing me back to that panel. Like, I, you know, put it away. I think I saw it at a comic book store. Like, I just saw it, and then come back. And I said, okay, there's something here, like some mythological pool. Or something because obviously I don't believe in coincidences in, in, in terms of inspiration. So I, I looked at like, okay, who is this guy? And of course we we know some things with the movies or so, but I, I did not I was not that familiar with the character. And then the more I researched, the more I realized, wow, like okay, that panel of him in the gutter, that was me. I was there. And sorry. Sometimes it just so hits. Um, trauma has a way of sneaking up on you sometimes. It just, you know, when people say, like, when are you completely healed? I'm like, any day now. <laughs> but, um, you know, so he was raw and he was damaged, and so was I. And uh, from then on, when I researched him, I realized that he, he, I think people think that he's a very simple character, and he actually is very complex because he mirrors our realities in so many different ways. And in this case, for me, he represented the need that I had to get angry. Like, not just a little angry. Pissed off. Like, mutants pissed. Yeah. Okay, and I, I went off on whoever I needed to go off on. And it was a matter of me proclaiming my truth, and I needed to fight back. And I was not going to win a legal battle, and I didn't care. It was a matter of I am going to make 
this as painful <laughs> as I can or prolong it because I am proclaiming my truth. And win or lose, that's what Wolverine taught me, is that sometimes in life things are not okay and we um, have to listen to our anger to remind us of you know, um, who we are and what we stand for and that's not to be compromised. And um, learning to live with post-traumatic stress myself, uh, the, the disorder myself, while treating patients and just realizing that just like Wolverine, we're all perfectly imperfect. We're all damaged in some way. And um, so that was the beginning. Wow. Now, Roy, when you had... All of that. <laughs> well, I want to take it back to the beginning because... Now, Len, Len Wein and Herb Trippi did the first story in art, mm -hmm. but I know that uh, the, the concept of Wolverine began with you, and I want to hear that story. But when you hear that, because so much has been built uh, from the foundation of where the character started, were you thinking about a psychologically damaged character when, when you were conceiving Wolverine? No, no, I, 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 I mean, I'll take whatever credit I feel, you know, I'm deserved, and I don't want, you know, and I owe him more. Uh, all the heavy lifting on the character, uh, you know, after its basic concept was done first by, well, John Romita designing a costume okay, sure. earlier. Uh, Len is the writer that I asked to, to do it, because he, he had the Hulk roaming around. I thought it would e be easy for him to get up to Canada and to do a story there, which he did very quickly. And, uh, and of course then Herb Trippi is the artist who actually had to take that one drawing or so of Wolverine and make it, he just later on other people added, Dave Cochran brought in like a face, because you know John Romita didn't design a face on him, and, and Cochran used the face of another character who I guess had been called the Wolverine that he had showed me before, had no connection with the thing I did, it was some character he had made up for DC. For the Legion of Superheroes, yeah, yeah, is that correct? Yeah, it meant nothing to me because uh, you know, I mean, I knew what a wolverine was since I was like five, you know, and I was always interested in animals. And, uh, and also I thought about, it. well, I'll tell you what happened. What happened is that uh, we were doing all these books. This was, I guess, 74, not too long before I quit as editor-in-chief. And it suddenly occurred to me one day that you know, we, had, we had, I don't know, 5%, 10%, whatever of our readers, you know, uh, certainly several percent were up in Canada. You know, they, they read English, they, uh, you know, they were there close, they got some of our comics. And, you know, we should have a Canadian character. I had already made up for X-Men, um, with intention with the artists, of course, uh, the Banshee and Sunfire, you know, with Irish and, and, and Japanese backgrounds. But I thought, you know, we should have a Canadian character. So I called Len in, and I said, you know, if Len hadn't been available or, you know, something, or somebody else was writing The Hulk, he would have been the person or whatever. But Len was, like, you know, one of the couple of very best, you know, writers in comics, so it worked out very well that way. And I called him up and, and I brought him in and said, just four things. I, I, his name's Wolverine. I thought about calling him Badger. You know, I wanted an animal that lives up in Canada. So what am I going to call him? You know, the moose? You know? Don't, don't let Mike Barron hear you to say that it was awful yeah, to call him you know, so, the badger. And yeah. ba but what, but what, what finally decided was not, I didn't remember the, the, uh, the name of, you know, the character that, uh, uh, Dave had, but the uh, the thing is that, or else I wouldn't have thought of the badger. But the thing is that uh, the, a badger, you know, as a verb, it just sounds like somebody's annoying you. You're badgering somebody. It doesn't have that right sound, even though the badger is a very fierce creature. Sure. And Wolverine, it, nobody knew what that was either. John Romita said that when he when he saw the name, he thought it was a female wolf, and he had to look it up in the dictionary encyclopedia. <laughs> but uh, uh, but I liked it because it sounded like wolf. You know, anything that sounds like wolf, wolf sure. is a good word oh, know, yeah. for a character. So Wolverine was good. So I just said, just, I wanted to call the Wolverine. You know, they dropped the the later, but that was the original thing. And he was Canadian. And Len had done uh, Brother Voodoo, a char another character concept of mine, a little, not quite as memorable as Wolverine. And, uh, uh, and I liked the way he had done the accent for that character, the Haitian, Haitian character. Of course, he gave him a Jamaican accent, but it still is an accent. <laughs> so I said, you can do a Canadian accent, you know, and so forth, which I guess meant putting the word A at the end. <laughs> but, and the other two things, which Len kind of forgot, and then he sort of rediscovered the wheel by Len himself, but I told him, I said, he's got to be short, because I, you know, Wolverine's a small animal. Uh, which I, I like, because all the heroes are all six foot something tall, and I, I wanted a hero that was shorter, or same height as me, say, or something, you know, there weren't that many of those. So, uh, 
And the other was that he would be very fierce because the wolverine was noted for attacking animals several times in size. And, and with that, I set it off to Len. And everything else was either done by Len with the artist or else a little later, after just a couple of stories by Len, by uh, Chris Claremont, who really developed the character the most. I, I forget, you know, myself, whether it was Len or what, so some of them gave him the, Adam, the, the, I didn't tell him, give him claws specifically, or let him, let him own adamantium claws. Okay. I'm happy he did, since I had also created adamantium, so it was nice, oh, but, but that was strictly either Len or, or Chris, and it was probably Chris in conjunction with um, Dave Cockrum originally, and later John Byrne, but especially with uh, the early days with Cockrum, that developed that character out to what he really became the breakaway star of the, uh, the X-Men. And one of Marvel's, you know, I'm happy to say, even though I don't own a piece of him or anything, one of Marvel's, you know, handful of most popular characters. But, you know, as I said, it was other people that did it all. I just sort of, my job was to kind of get things going. It wasn't even to create characters, but once in a while when I had an idea, I would either do it myself or get somebody else to do it. And that was basically it. But I'm afraid that, you know, it would, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, Len and her were no longer with us, but, uh, you know, uh, they were the ones that, you know, really got it, go got it going. It is interesting that, as you say, it started from a Dave Cockrum drawing for the Legion of Superheroes. So there is Timberwolf, who's very similar to Wolverine, yeah, but doesn't hold a candle. I don't, I don't think it started from that drawing at all. Oh, okay. But I, I just think he did it first. I see. But, and I saw it, but I saw about 10 characters. Okay. And as I said, when I started from the thing, I started to think of just animals, and I thought of Wolverine and Badger and Moose and maybe a couple other animals. But what Dave did that, that what later was, when, when Wolverine takes off his mask, sort of, he gave him the head, I think, that he had had for the civilian version of Wolverine, but of course that had nothing to do with his creation because you know uh, he didn't have that. Then. But that's the thing, you know. Uh, you start creating things. You, some characters have one creator. Bill Everett created the Submariner. Nobody else. Probably Carl Burgess created Human Torch. Yep. I sort of say Bob Kane and Batman, but we know that isn't true. But anyway, <laughs> and our Dr. Bolton and uh, Wonder Woman, that's not true. But, uh, you know, a few things have one creator, sure. but mostly they, often they have two, or, or in the case of some, four or five or, or six. And with Wolverine, you'd have to have at least three or four before you could even... I, I got annoyed when they, I think they left her Trippy's name off of the, oh, the awesome. Logan movie. They had, no they had kidding. A dude, wow. and I was really annoyed. Because, Absolutely. Because the guy who did, but and yet when they've got Luke Cage on Netflix, they give George Tuska a credit, and, and his his role in Luke Cage would have been exactly what hers was. Sure. The characters had one drawing, and you know, and then yeah. do that story from a plot. You know. So, Absolutely. But you know, they do the best they can with these credits. You know, it's hard to. And, you know, it's hard to figure out who did it, because if you ask, you know, everybody did it, you know. <laughs> well, and it was a group effort. And in fact, because of that, there was always this mystery about Wolverine. And for decades, that was part of the intrigue of Wolverine was mm -hmm. he didn't know his background. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know his background. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Suzanne, I want to uh, I, I know from you as well, um, because I love the book. I read the book, and it's, it's fantastic, because it really is a hand-in-hand -hand examination of Wolverine's personal psychoses, but reflected through the comics and in the films. And, um, you know, Paul Jenkins was given the, the assignment back in two, the early 2000s to do the origin story, and that was very controversial, and I remember the controversy, and I've even interviewed Paul about said controversy as well. So, um, you know, well, both of you, and, and Susanna, we'll start with you first, was it helpful that there was a clear origin? Because again, for us, a lot of times as the fans, the, real, the, the mystery was always part of the entry. So. I'm very grateful that the origin story was written because as a psychologist, we always go back to the child founder. Where did it start? Like, Tell me about your mother. <laughs> <laughs> or in this case, um, the absent, the emotionally absent mother, um, which led to what we call complex trauma. You know, where you are repeatedly uh, either ignored or ne neglected by a primary parent, and um, your self-esteem is, of course, affected. Your sense of trust, um, your your fear of vulnerability. This is probably sounding very familiar, right? Um, the uh, need to distance yourself from people when you when they get too close. That is complex trauma, and the the associate the the memory loss. We call that associative amnesia. Um, so we had a name for all of these things, but everything began to make sense. And so Paul Jenkins was one of the first people, was the first person that I interviewed 
Um, I got connected with him uh, through a friend, uh, Elliot Serrano, King of Peace of Chicago. I know Elliot. And uh, so he and I started talking about why we were both drawn to Wolverine, and uh, the answer was simply uh, pain. We both experienced, you know, um, pain in some way, but again, who hasn't? And uh, so I just did want to share that interesting uh, part because he was very kind and very supportive, and he said, "So you're sharing your story," and I was like, <laughs> "Like the psychologists are not supposed to do that," and he said, "It humanizes you," and um, it's it's. Um, literature and, and reality in the sense that Wolverine is afraid of vulnerability and right now you need to conquer yours. And I said, okay, I will if you will. And he had his own story and he's like, oh, you know, so we kind of agreed um, to share our, our stories there. So yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful the origin story existed because it added to the explanation of why Logan is the way that he is, you know, and also why perhaps he's attracted to redheads. Right, Rose O'Hara, right? Um, and why um, he goes after that. me? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, why uh, he goes after perhaps the unattainable? It's safer, right? So if, uh, we, we can get to the women. Yeah, I intend right? to we'll get, get to, to the, the women. women. Absolutely. And, and, yeah. Uh, what each of them represents to him. Sure. So Roy, when, when uh, and again, also as an editor, and these pieces of Wolverine's mm -hmm. history were were added to. You know the the story and everything. Mm -hmm. was, you know, was it great that he was a man of mystery? Mm -hmm. Was it great when they finally decided to? Uh... Well, you have to remember, by the time the Wolverine comic came out, and then six months a year later, the uh, the giant size X Men, which was like his next. So uh, Miller, I was, Miller, yeah, Miller I was Claremont. Gone. Right. Okay. Yeah, I had left being editor in chief, and although I almost came back, I ended up not. So basically, that was really you know out of my hands. I, okay. I paid. You know, I. I, I only uh, I read a bunch of X Men back in about 1983 or so when uh, my then writing partner in movies Jerry Conway and I were writing an X Men movie script for Orion that never got made and, and the, the the people that were doing it they they wanted to change it in ways that you know I didn't think were right but they did they were smart enough to keep Wolverine in it anyway uh, so then at that time I went back and was reading the material by that had been drawn by Cockerman and Larry Byrne and. And, and I, I read that and so forth, and you know I found they had really done some nice things with that uh, with that character, and, and it's interesting to see. Of course, that I would sporadically I would see that somebody was doing something weird, like you know, like Frank Miller with his the taking him to Japan yes, and all that yes. it became the base of what the second of the Wolverine movies and so forth. Indeed. And, but it was interesting that you know you you know you've got a good character, I guess, uh, that uh, we all it, made up together out of pieces when it's open to that kind of interpretation, because all these characters, I think, I guess Batman may be the supreme example, uh, they all became, they're all like Rorschach tests or blots, you know, they, you know, eventually you've got, you get enough writers and enough artists and everybody wants to have his own interpretation, and if the editors allow that, encourage it, and the audience encourages it as they have in recent years, you're going to, Sometimes it gets a little weird, like I think it's like there are, there are at least 15 or 20 Batmans now that would not even recognize each other in the same room, I sometimes think. <laughs> Wolverine, I think, is, and I, I, this is the approach I prefer, I think is always Wolverine, and, and there's been a respect for what the character was, and it's built up, but, it's, but thank heaven they haven't yet yielded, as far as I know, to the temptation. The usual temptation is, is for the, the egotistic creator to come in and say, everything you know about character X is wrong, but I'm here to tell you what it really is like. You know, when you do that, you know you're in the, in the presence of an egotistical idiot who will not be telling you the definitive anything, but he may still do some good work. <laughs> I love also, and, and we will get into the women, but as far as the Howlett family, uh, Sabretooth's role mm -hmm. in, in Wolverine's formation of his character, and the mind tricks that Sabretooth over the years has been playing with Wolverine. It, I'm your father, I'm your brother. A lot of you know, Very, very, uh, and now I'm blanking, uh, Chinatown. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you will. I just saw the movie, so I'll let her come. Yeah. Um, I, I think in terms of that formation, a lot of it had to do with Paul Jenkins and his brother. And Interesting. So, yeah, yeah, that's a little wow. preview, right? And, uh, so we started talking about the nature versus nurture argument. You know, how could two brothers that grow up in a relatively, you know, uh, similar household end up so different? And again, I don't want to divulge too much, but 
Um, he just remembered that you know, his family struggled financially and they were always at the bottom of the hill. You know, and uh, so he switched certain genders, like his, you know, the grandfather, the surly grandfather was actually his grandmother, um, and you know, other things. But it talked about, you know, feeling like an outcast and feeling like a reject and feeling like you have to prove yourself. And the psychological toll it took on two brothers and how they ended up in different places. And I, so I, that's when I told him, Paul, you have to let me share this. You must let me share that's this. Excellent. You have to. And uh, I'm glad he did. That's excellent. This can be a group therapy session, so if, if you would like to chime in with questions as we're discussing, I'm, I'm happy to open it to the floor as well, or, we, or the three of us can talk. So seriously, consider that as, as, we, uh, as we move on. Uh, but also, I, I, all right, so we, we mentioned briefly uh, Logan's women. Yes. The women that fascinate Logan, the women, both the attainable and the unattainable. Yes. And that, again, great great part of your book is you kind of go down from Rose to Jean and uh, Eureka, as I always get her name wrong. So Mariko, Mariko is, uh, I keep her, get confusing her with um, the other uh, Japanese Yuriko. character. Yuriko. Yeah, Yuriko and everything. But yeah, so talk, yeah, talk about, talk about uh, the loves of Logan. Okay, the many, many, many loves of Logan. So I, I talk about um, triangulated love, and uh, not to be confused with love triangle. Um, so it, it talks about like how you need, you know, like love, you know, trust and commitment and, uh, and sex, of course, right? And, and so, you know, I had to do an analysis of what each character meant. And I knew I was going down a, a dangerous road, right? Because, you know, it was like, okay, picking who is the love of his life? Is it Jean or is it Mariko? And I make an argument that, you know, in many ways, Jean represents his strength. She's a fellow mutant the most, I mean, arguably, you know, one of the most powerful mutants. Mm -hmm. And so I think she represents his strength and, um, and his mutation, but I think Mariko represents his vulnerability and um, his um, willingness um, to, to uh, ex experience that in order to, to better himself. Like, she makes him want to be a better man. And so there's a difference between infatuated love Right, I'm, I'm not, in my book, I don't say like he doesn't love her. He loves her. He loves Jean. Yes, but it's an infatuation. It's it's a love that has not come to fruition. And you do wonder, like, if these two actually did hook up, right? Would they last? And I, I think Jean is a very like rational, reasonable person. That's why she chooses Scott, because Logan is not a safe bet. You know, like you know, he's either gonna hurt you. You know, or he's going to stab you in the bedroom accidentally. You know, <laughs> and so um, you know, he, he, he's he's a little bit of a liability, sure. and uh, she understands. And foreplay is fine. <laughs> that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. You know, if, it, if it's a you know short term thing, no problem, right? And I think there's always been chemistry between them. Like there's oh, yeah. always been that connection. Um, but I think she she makes a decision based on her head instead of her heart, and. Um, you know, so yeah, she's very near and dear. And in terms of the movies, I, I you could see that he was just never the same after, um, you know, that Jean character died. And so, but I think that he finds new life through Monica. It, Roy, you know, I'm glad you mentioned the movies because, as you say, when when the character was originally created, he was meant to be this small, little, unattractive guy. And, and, didn't and, yet, to, he didn't and have yet. to be unattractive. He just had well, to be mean. But yeah, all right, small mean guy. There yeah, you go. Yeah. What, more of a more, and I, and I know you're a pulp guy. More of a Monk Mayfair. Yeah. Than a Doc yeah. Savage. And I so. think Alu of me had in mind uh, a, a favorite character. He was a minor character at DC, but a character I always loved as a kid, probably because I was small. Uh, the Atom. Sure. Of the Justice Society, who later did become atomic powered. He was always a tough, and he was always a tough, mean kind of guy. He wore this kind of leather. These leather pants, you know, <laughs> brown leather pants. Yeah. It was like a girdle almost, and you know, he didn't have any power, but he was a mean little guy. There was well, trained this, by a boxing yeah, trainer yeah, and everything. There, there was a, and so forth, and of course, I didn't really know that when I was growing up. I was just he just appealed because he was okay. small and strong, you know, and everything. And and, and the other favorite character of mine. Uh, uh, another one that I used to play at being when I was a kid was Doll Man. Sure. Who, now he was like eight inches tall. You know, he's giant compared to at the later Adam. But, of the Freedom you know, Fighters and, and people and that, the Doll Man character and things like this. But uh, so I didn't really, you know. But I, I, obviously Hugh Jackman is not alarmingly short. Yeah, let's talk about that because then we get Matinee Idol, Hugh Jackman. Hey, great Logan. 
don't get me wrong. Right, right. I, I, I just quickly forgot the, the whole short thing. <laughs> Wasn't that important? He's still smaller than a lot of the other X-Men. I mean, Colossus and his, you know some of these other characters. He's still not huge. Kind of I mean, the size about him. Yeah, actually, important. I think he's kind of the you know, leading man yeah. six foot tall. Yeah, yeah. He's six two. Yeah, but the size, I mean, I've never met him. I don't know but if still you the guys size, have seen I mean, him on wasn't red carpet. Important thing that wasn't what you usually thought about it was the size. It was sure. the fierceness, really. That you know, you think of the size in connection with some characters like Thor. Mm-hmm. But size isn't what you think of when you think of Wolverine, even if he's played by a six foot guy. It's all about size. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. Have you have you enjoyed the X Men movies, Roy? Me? Yeah. Yeah, mostly. Uh, you know, Apocalypse to me was like too much like a cartoon villain out of a Saturday morning cartoon. Little disappointing. But I, but I do generally like the uh, the movies. They're so complex sometimes. It's, you know, not if you're not a regular reader of the books, it's a little hard to follow. And then of course it's going to veer off in its own direction. But you know, I'm not going to quibble with the, what was the real first. Marvel superhero, you know, success and so forth, and, and the fact they've made a number of the movies, or with what, you know, Len, Chris, and the other guys did with it in the comics and so forth. You know, it's, it's an amazing accomplishment, and even after, what, the larger part of two decades, yeah. it's still a going, uh, going concern, and uh, now leading to, you know, to, uh, to more things in the future. So I, I think it's, it's great. I'm disappointed that we won't see yeah. Hugh Jackman's yeah. slogan yeah. interact with... Yeah. The Marvel Cinematic Universe, because mm-hmm. that's a great opportunity. I can appreciate him feeling like, all right, it's time to go. Yeah. But you know, Susanna, what do you what do you think of? Because again, I'm glad that you explore both the comics and the films. Well, as I um, got into this world and, and started you know, the research, and then the first thought that occurred to me was like, I have like 40 years of research. Sure. Yeah. And I'm like, what do I do? You know? <laughs> um, and of course, you. Know, I, I knew the, the movies first, but I, I experienced what a lot of uh, X-Men fans experienced when they first see the movies. I'm like, wait, that's not right. And that's certainly not right. You know, you know, my husband's like, stop. <laughs> it's not right. Like, it's incorrect or so. Um, I, I enjoyed them too. I think Hugh Jackman definitely brought Wolverine. You know, and I, I, the, the aspect I think he brought the best was the vulnerability. Like, um, he made Wolverine very likable, and you, you you cared about him. He, you felt compassion and empathy for him, and you, he, he really exemplified the suffering. You know, like how, how he is a tortured soul in many ways. Um, so no, I, I definitely enjoy the films. I agree about the apocalypse film, but um, I do. You're lucky the X-Men was canceled for a few years there, or else you'd had any more. Yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> Luckily, I had a lot of help. Any questions from the audience? Or we can continue, sir. How do you feel about Logan as a, as a bookend to that uh, portrayal of the character? Yeah, I'd like to hear. The continuation of that, um, that common theme of anyone who really gets close to him and anyone he loves comes to a bad end. I thought the movie was superb. I loved the ending. Um, I cried like a baby. Um, because in order to write this book, I had to really imagine that this person was real. So he was real to me um, in order to write it. And, and to have that excruciating, very painful ending uh, was hard uh, for many of us. Um, I love that um, his, the, the struggle continued, the inner conflict continued. And Magneto absolutely was still right <laughs> in, in many regards. The oppression is still there, and, and mutants are never seen as equals, and they're still hiding or, or such, but, um, you know, those that are the newer generation. But I think that um, my favorite part was the ending where everyone's seen it, right? I'm not going to be, okay. Um, <laughs> like that Spoilers. Was, I'm really sorry. Um, you know, where he had to let that vulnerability go. Like, he had to work through it. That is the whole, that's what he means to me, is that it is um, resurrection, if you will, through through suffering. It is healing through suffering. And at that moment, he saw Laura, and he left her that legacy of don't become what they make you. And also, he dies on his back from the blood of his heart and hand. Which is very close to, um, yeah, yeah, it was uh, foretelling, right? Like, you know, there's blood everywhere, you have your heart in your hand, it was very beautifully done. I think the part that got me even more than the death itself was when Laura grabbed the cross 
and she, everybody choked up now. Um, she, she turned it over to an ex, you know, because he was the last X-Men yep. at that point in the year. I'm like, ah, oh, okay, it's enough, right? Um, but it was true, he was, and that was more appropriate for him. I think the, the, the movie did it justice. I think that it, um, the, this, this long road that uh, Hugh Jackman had, it, he ended it beautifully, very beautifully. What do you think of the X Men or the Wolverine movies, Roy? Uh, I liked all the movies. The, the, the last one was definitely the, probably the high point. Uh, I probably don't quite remember it as, as well, you know, maybe because as I saw it just as, a, as another movie, I enjoyed it. I was eating my popcorn, sitting there. Low. You know, I always go to theaters like uh, I go in some like a Monday afternoon. I'm like the only. <laughs> it's almost like a private screening usually, uh, even though a popular movie. Uh, I enjoyed it tremendously. I thought it was a real. It was the first uh, what R-rated. Yeah, of, well, uh, Dark Knight. Of, of the Marvel movies. Of the Marvel, of the Marvel movies, movies, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, yeah, and you're right, technically Deadpool, but, yeah, you know, Fox, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. exactly. But, uh, yeah, and uh, so you know, I thought that, so I, I like that. I guess know, they both are Fox, right? I, I probably, you know, just uh, didn't, you know, don't remember it quite as well. And okay. I, I saw it, and I've seen a lot of the movies since, but I, I intend to, you know, watch it again one of these days. I just haven't got around to it, but it was an e excellent movie. Stan always said that, you know, Stan Lee always leaned on the fact that, you know, mutants were uh, substitutions for minorities and some of the problems yeah. and stuff. Was that evident in, in the 60s and, and 70s? Nah. Yeah, honestly, Roy, and I appreciate you saying that because, truthfully, I, I mean, I'm was, glad that it grew I, into I, that. I, I, I'll tell you the thing, too. I think it was there from the beginning. But I doubt if, you know, Stan and, and Jack, because they both yeah. worked on the plot side, I, I doubt if they really ever consciously thought, except, of course, you know, it's the human condition, so you're naturally, you know, you, when you start building a character and you're trying to get human emotions, it's going to come out, and whether they actually physically thought, they did sort of think about the outsider, and I don't think, I don't think that they were necessarily thinking, of, you know, like the civil rights connections per yeah. se, or something real close, but again, you know, it, it was still, things were in the air. If they had created it two or three years later, probably they would have been more so. But, you know, it's, it's still something that they were aware of. And the whole idea of the outsider has been endemic to a lot of superheroes from Submariner and after right. Batman on. And so they just took it and did it. I don't think that that was Stan's main motivation. Uh, but once he did his version of it, and once Jack started drawing and adding to the plot, and they all put it together, it was, it was there from the start. And it had to be there in the start because already, but just about what? Three or four years in, when Stan was finished the run, they did. They had. He had they had re, it had become conscious enough that they did the Sentinel storyline, which, as far as I'm concerned, is is almost the only really, really good uh, X Men stuff. I mean, I like the whole series, but uh, but the only thing that really, to me, stands out as really exceptional storyline in the entire series is, you know, that, that Stan and Jack did before they turned it over to lesser lights like me. Ah. Is, uh, and, and believe me, I did kind of plunge for it. I'm concerned that because, you know, we didn't have uh, the, the initial inspiration, was the, uh, the Sentinel storyline because by that time he had realized that it was about, uh, you know, uh, bigotry and things of it. And it was, you know, uh, telling, it was, you know, made very, very clear in that story. And so, which means that, it was kind of partly there, and on the one hand, they kind of by then he'd sort of consciously recognized it and decided to really play with it, and and they really you know did it with a bang. That's cool, Susanna. What did, did you and, and and not to put you on the spot, given that he's right next to you, but have you read Roy's uh, run on uh, X Men, <laughs> Roy and Neil? Um, Roy and Neil. Uh, Roy and Neil Adams. Uh, Roy, Roy Thomas and Neil Adams. They didn't have Wolverine. I have to read. Yeah, they do yeah. not have Wolverine. Actually. Yeah, I, I don't think I have. Okay. Well, we, when I started out, it, it was just kind of imitating Stan and Jack, except without Jack, mm -hmm. and uh, th that makes a difference, you know. Sure. And uh, uh, but it was still okay. But I don't think I was too inspired, nor were the couple of people who did it after me. The lucky thing that happened was that uh, Stan asked me to. The sales were, you know, they were kind of soft, and so he eventually asked me to come back. I guess they'd been a little better under me. And uh, just one issue after I brought it back, Neil Adams walked in the door and uh, said he'd like to do some, you know, awful, you know, some book that wasn't selling. And so I said, well, we got X Men. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Can so you there imagine? It is. And uh, Neil and I had, let me just remember, we had met, you know, a couple times previously, but what at least once. But you know, I was, you know, I, I'd seen his work, really liked it. We we got on like a house fire and things, and uh, you know, I would sort of just give him a little direction and 
you know, let him do whatever he, he wanted to do. I had some ideas, you know, he had more, and he would just do whatever he wanted to do, and we'd sort of tie it together. Go out to lunch, by the end of the lunch, we had some kind of story, you know, you know. And I think those issues, those, now those issues, I'm not gonna apologize for those, those were good issues. Yeah. You know, and uh, for, both, for both of us. Truly. And I think they were rather influential on what happened later that agree. Chris and, and uh, the other people were doing, uh, and so forth, in that sense, but, you know, uh, if we'd done Wolverine, maybe we'd have done okay by it, but we'd never had a shot at it. But I want to get back to Logan and also more of your questions. Are there, are there other questions about, uh, sir, in the front? Um, kind of a twofold question. I'm not sure how recent in your research for the book uh, you went, but there's the old man Logan <laughs> book going on, and of course the return of Wolverine, <laughs> where he magically escaped the adam adamantium. Um, did you go into the that at all with your research? What are your thoughts on the Old Man Logan storyline? And now apparently he's going back and they're gonna kill him with that and that sort of thing. Well, a funny thing about- well, That um, sort of trauma feeling. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, here, here's a funny story about um, Wolverine coming back. So the book was complete and one of my friends called me and said, you have to read <laughs> And I was like, what? And he's like, don't turn it in until you read So I was like, okay. So then, you know, here I am. And I get to the end, I was like, crap, <laughs> because I had a, you know, and uh, yeah, you know, another section to it, um, because sure enough, and you know, the first thought that occurred to me is like, you can't toy with my emotions like this. You know, like we had a completion, I had mourning, you know, I went through the grief stages, and, and now you're doing this to me, you know, and, and then, um, acceptance. Acceptance, yeah, acceptance, and then, you know, and then, um, you know, my world gets turned upside down. Um, I did address the old man Logan, which was, of course, the uh, inspiration for the Logan movie in sure. itself, right? It gives, like, a Western feel, a readiness, um, and here's someone who has, you know, I am never going to unsheathe my claws again because, um, you know, of, of the damage that he did, um, which was different than the Logan movie. Absolutely, yeah. And I, I'll be fair and around to say I think that the um, Xavier being responsible for the massacre makes more sense to me. Because I understand. Because he had the power to do that. Like, you know, the, uh, the other X-Men were pretty powerful, too. I don't know if they could, you know, if Wolverine could wipe them all up, you know? So, Understood. Um, but, you know, just that notion of guilt and shame, um, you know, that lives within this, you know, character. And, um, you know, I remember a, a conversation with John Romita Jr., where he talked about you know his rage, and it occurred after 9/11, and um, he said that at that moment he wanted to be judge, jury, and executioner, and, and wanted whoever was responsible. You know, he's like, love New York, and no one's going to do this to New York, and you know. But he said you have to temper that, you know, with with um, with balance and grace because you can't. And he's like, but however Wolverine is, he is judge, jury, and executioner, and that's by far too much for one person to carry. And that, of course, leads credence to the old man Logan, you know, beginning where he's done. He doesn't want to do this anymore. I also like how, beyond the uh, Mark Miller's uh, miniseries, um, what they've done with old man Logan in, mm -hmm. in the more recent years, and that they are wrapping that up to allow modern day Wolverine to come back and everything. But I really enjoyed his role in the 616. And, and, and again, like you said, carrying that guilt and, and seeing a, an alternate universe where the damage hasn't happened yet, but it's almost like knowing that it could happen and that kind of responsibility. And I really, I, I understand why it's necessary to go back to modern Wolverine and I'm all for it, but I have to say, I really did enjoy Exploring Old Man Logan Beyond Miller's. So miniseries. you think they'll leave him in the comics? Then you think Marvel's no, not going to retire? No, I think I think uh, I think it's I think Lo Old Man Logan will will wrap up. Ooh, yeah, wrap up. Yeah, but, so so they're, so they're not, they're not going to let uh, Wolverine go the way of uh, Hugh Jackman. Huh? Probably. Well, they might as far as uh, how however they get rid of him. I I, I don't know. I'm, no, I, no. What I meant is, but uh, what I meant is maybe no more be in the young comics figure. the same way that maybe there won't be another Wolverine in the movies. But I, I think Marvel uh, kind of. Hang on to them. You know that. Yeah. Come on, right? They can't get rid of the original. Come on, it's been facetious. 
But it, you but, got three going on at the same time. But isn't it? It know? is. Mm -hmm. It is fun because there is that wish fulfillment, and you have a character like Batman where it's like, well, let Dick Grayson be Batman and stuff. And they've done it for, for a moment. And Azrael, certainly, and Danny O'Neill can speak to that. Obviously, Danny will be here, by the way, Sunday, if you guys are here all weekend. So Ben, Danny O'Neill's here and, and find out about all that. But yeah, I mean, I mean and that's why, as uh, with Infinity War, and every, uh, it's great to see, as I'm sure we all feel that way, when we see, uh, forgive the term, mainstream audiences go, what? But Spider-Man's dead. I, I, what's gonna happen now? And it's like, and I love all the nerd blogs. Here's how they can bring him back. And it's like, really? Come on, man. I, there's like dozens and hundreds of writers and artists that have been doing it a lot better than Jimmy's blog, telling you how Black Panther could come back. These are the same people that believe Superman was going to die. Exactly. Oh, you remember like, <laughs> DC had this idea out of desperation? Sure. Do, do Absolutely. The death of Superman, which they had done a couple of times before, and they but only out. in imaginary stories. Really. Yeah, and, but they so, okay, yeah, <laughs> you can tell the difference. But uh, <laughs> so, but they do it on a slow news day, you know. When there's they couldn't do it now. There's too much news, but back then, I guess, you know, 20 years yeah. ago, they could, they, the slow news day, so all these reporters, hey, the DC Comics is killing off Superman, and there's going to be no more Superman, and they put it out, and these idiots, you know, go out and buy all these comics, <laughs> and then, you know, and then, and then, of course, they're shocked, they think they're going to put their children through school by buying 100 copies of the death of Superman, you know? so <laughs> it was great. In my research, I just realized that death doesn't stick. Right, and there's yeah. a lot of brainwashing. Those they, are the they get better. Things. A lot of brainwashing. They also, yeah. they get better. A lot of brainwashing. Yeah. Right, yeah. especially when people go down the aisle, ever, apparently, or something, you know, and they change their minds or something. You explore, um, and and sir, I will get to your question. You explore, um, you know, certainly his time at, uh, and I'm and now I'm blanking with Stryker and uh, and Weapon X, you know, the Weapon X period, the World War II period as well is, is yeah. certainly mentioned in there. Yeah, the Weapon in your X book. Very Winter Smith was hard. That was so difficult. And um, because Why is that? It, because the only way, I was trying to wrap my head around, like, okay, how do I write this in psychological terms? And so I said, okay, it's so the psychology of torture. And, and I had to do research of, you know, what is real? Like, what actually happens? And so every evening, like I either needed a scotch or a Disney film. <laughs> Afterwards, you know, I was just like, this is this is not okay, right? Like, you know, I am being taken to a very, very, very dark place um, because there's a lot of atrocities that do occur. And um, I knew in my book that Weapon X and the X Men chapter were going to be controversial. Um, and I can I, I can talk about the X Men thing too later on in a second. But um, yeah, Weapon X, I, 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 that is probably my favorite series. Um, because the, he goes into like the, the subconscious mind, you know, and you know, even in his, you know, uh, uh, the state of him being, uh, you know, assaulted and victimized and, and being experimented on, he still he wanted to destroy them. You know, you see that yeah. rage there, and and his battle. And I and I have heard, and I also argue that the Weapon X program probably led to him to his great humanity because he was fighting against being controlled, like he was fighting for his humanity. So I believe that, you know, like he, that, that led to the ultimate dualistic nature of the character. Very cool. Sir, you had a question? Thanks. Um, I guess that kind of changed my question a little bit because I, I was curious what you made of that period and maybe somebody could help me if I get some details wrong. I think it's after he lost his adamantium when he is in this sort of bestial stage and it's uh, Electra that sort of helps him bring out his humanity. And that was something I was always curious about him was that he's always found this appeal with uh, Japan and with very structured orders of either ninjutsu or the samurai. Um, and he is sort of interesting in that he is like, if you look at like Plato's tripartite soul, He's mostly appetite and spirit. There's not a lot of reason. Um, and I guess, what is his appeal? Is it the structure of uh, those kind of codes of um, Japan? What, what is the appeal there for him? I can answer them. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to hear both I, of you answer that, actually. It's, um, you <laughs> <laughs> no um, I think it's the, the honor. That, that he strives for. It's the code of honor and loyalty and discipline. 
Um, and in, in my book, I also talked about his enemies. And I listed uh, Cyclops as one of them, only because, yeah, I mean, it's interesting, right? But I listed him as one because I, I think that he is envious of the discipline that Cyclops has and that he perhaps may never acquire um, on some level. Um, and so perhaps, you know, maybe the, the Buddhist nature of, you know, like balance or peace or so. So that, that's what I think. What do you think? What she said. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I, th I think there is something to the structure. Well, able, being able to channel the rage mm -hmm. and, and, and the way that, a, that a, a great samurai warrior can go berserker when he needs to, but also, you know, keep it tight when he needs to as well. I wondered also, both of you, and I don't know, uh, Roy, if you've read uh, Greg Rucka's Wolverine run. Uh, and Susanna, I don't know if you've read his I run either. I'm sorry. Okay, because yeah, I thought I thought he had a more introspective Logan, which kind of turned off some fans, but I found interesting and stuff. Give me give me the time call there, Pat. My glasses were not ten minutes. Ten minutes. Oh, you know, honestly, that's like right at six, and we want to give it, people a chance to come in and see the fonts. So I'm going to say five minutes actually, if that's okay, because you want to get people a chance to come in and What's the fonts. The fonts, Henry the Winkler. Font. Oh. Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. We're we're the opening act for Henry Winkler and everything. Yeah. So well, that's and also the romance thing kind of ran over because we went right till right till uh, five. But anyway, uh, um, please another question. Uh, John. Yes, John. I have a question. This book sounds very interesting. Where would I go to buy it and purchase it? <laughs> oh yeah, we'll get to that. <laughs> Thank you. It's uh. What, the title. What's your name? Yeah. Exactly. What John is. It's called is... Untamed. It's called yes. Untamed. The Psychology of Marvel's Wolverine. You yeah. talk about un the What's your name? <laughs> exactly. And it is found at Amazon or Barnes and Noble or any bookstore. Damn straight. Um, I had a fight for this title. We were having this conversation because, and you could answer this question better, but um, my understanding is that uh, there's. Um, a derivative of the Greek language that, you know, it means like adamantium and it's, you know, um, so it's derivative of ad adamantium. Or adamantium is untamed or it's, it's like strength or untamed. And so I had to explain that. Wow. Well, and, well, adamantium means like, you know, yeah, or unbreakable. Or, unbreakable. The thing is, the, uh, well, I've said before, but um, maybe I'll just mention where the name came from since adamantium is such an important part of Wolverine. and you probably yes. you have it in Absolutely. the book. Absolutely. Right. Because you may have asked me about it, but the thing is that Back when I was doing Avengers with uh, Barry Smith was uh, drawing a couple of issues and I doing it was the second Ultron storyline Ultron six of an infinite number collectible all and uh, <laughs> he uh, and I wanted to get a medal that would be the, the most the hardest medal you could possibly ever have anything else could only be you know break up against it and I needed a name. And I, you know, couldn't think. I, I'm not that good at names. I never liked the names I made up. You know, I can choose a good one like Wolverine, but I wasn't that good at inventing names as Stan, Jack, and some other people are. But I remembered that I had been that in, back in the early '60s when I had it on my shelf at home. Uh, I had a particular English language translation of Aeschylus's uh, Greek tragedy, uh, Prometheus Bound. Oh sure. And, and uh, on the very like first page or so, there's also a couple of characters like Kratos and Bea, Force and Might. I made them characters of the Avengers later too. And, and and there's a line in there that Prometheus is brought up to be you know so he can be chained up here and his gizzard will be out eaten every day. They'll grow back and then they'll get it the next day. And and there's talk and there's uh, uh, talk about that he's bound in adamantine chains. Now, I heard the word adamant, but adamantine. I hadn't seen that word before before sixty two zero or whatever I saw it. So suddenly it just came to me, at adamantine, and then from that it just became adamantium. And you know, my greatest sorrow now is that they can't they can't use that in the Marvel Studios movies because it's kind of controlled. You know, it's stuck in the X Men universe because it's all oh, funny. Well, they because this is the one thing that I thought I did better than Stan and Jack. I think adamantium is a better metal name than vibranium. But you know, they're both, they're both okay. They're both oh no, okay. absolutely. But, I'm, I'm pretty biased about the press, but adamantium, I accidentally stumbled into something kind of nice. There. Well, in case the merger it, it doesn't go through, it, I imagine eventually we will be using adamantium. Yeah, that's, then they'll have a, uh, you know, vibranamantium vibra or something. Well, you have to, yeah. yeah, well, you've got to test the metal against metal. Absolutely, right, right, come on. Right, right. Foregone conclusion, <laughs> absolutely. Other questions? We've got about two minutes left, sir. Unrelated question to psychology. Uh, since you did so much research in the Wolverine, like any of the other characters involved with him, like what's your next favorite? Um, stay tuned. Uh, oh, is there? Yeah, uh, there's another, there's another book. Atta girl, that's awesome. I'll tell you. 
Oh, and by the way, I'm also signing the books here, too. So. Excellent. Good. I'm glad you're going to be at Artist Alley. That's cool. No, that's great. Yes, please. Um, meeting the writers and the illustrators and the creators. Nice. Because that, um, you know, what I was going to say is very briefly about the, the, the X Men, like where they get to be minorities or something. Here's what I would say to that: is that the the, the, the mind is very complex, and so the subconscious mind is also very complex. So even if it wasn't conscious, it might have even been subconscious. And I think that you know, writers and illustrators put you know their stuff, they project it onto their character. Their characters, of course, it's inevitable. Um, and so it was meeting them and meeting their stories, and also just it, it's a different, you know, culture and, and being embraced in, in this journey. This has been the best part by yeah. far. Well, remember, this this is a these are two characters that were totally created by a, 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 a Jewish writer editor and a Jewish co-plotter uh, artist. Uh, characters with secret identities. Neither one of whom was using the name they were born with. I mean, you know, there's there's got to be a lot of stuff in there. So the mere fact that they, whether they, whether as I said, they recognized or were constantly trying to do it. But as somebody said, you know, and many people said, you can't write writing. You got to write something. And uh, so, you, so you, you dig into whatever you had, and I'm sure that, that some part of the, uh, the the Jewish experience probably that's one reason why it worked so well, maybe with uh, some of the Holocaust uh, stuff with uh, Magneto and and. and uh, uh, Professor X, simply right. because, you know, it, 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 that came again out of the experience of the two people who really created the X-Men between them. Absolutely. That's great. You know, I'm going to wrap up because we want to, again, give people a chance to get to the next panel. The title of the book, again, Untamed, The Psychology of Wolverine, and they're both in Artist Alley. Check them out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if you enjoyed this uh, level of conversation, I'll also come to woodbuilding.com and listen to some of these podcasts. I just want to say one thing. Please. I just want to thank you personally for creating Wolverine and for inspiring millions around the world. And for, in my personal case, help in a very surprising way, creating a character that um, helped change me for the better. Well, to the really special idea. All right, class is out. Great discussion. Susanna Flores and Roy Thomas on the psychology of Wolverine. Well, there you go, folks. Uh, I do uh, suggest you check out um, Bleeding Cool. I thought they did a fantastic article about it. Uh, there are other websites as well that are addressing this, uh, air quotes, controversy. I still don't know. I really don't know. We weren't there. And also, the Uber fans like us, we're all uh, outraged and a little disappointed. Uh, the average convention goer, they're not going to know. They're not going to care. The average movie goer, they're not going to know. They're not going to care. But it does bother me. And um, I just feel like Roy, and his more so his representation, instead of uh, reminding us how uh, great Roy's contributions to comics have been, there's been an overstep and an overreach. And unfortunately, uh, that and other controversies that I think were unfair, like when uh, Roy made a point of talking about Iron Fist and referred to him as a character that was um, influenced by Oriental, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 factors. And uh, he said, oh, you know, I guess Oriental isn't a good word anymore. Well, um, you know, it isn't, but Roy's, you know, Roy's in his 80s, and I, 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 I don't think he meant it with any malice, but that was a little knock on Roy recently. And now this thing, and this overreach of creation, when Roy him literally has dozens of other characters that are significant, and he deserves the absolute credit for as the writer... Um, it's almost like if, if Stan were still around and said, well, you know, I was editor-in-chief, so I should get credit for Ultron. And it's like, well, yeah, no. You know, I, I, but again, we weren't there. And I, I point to the Barry Allen example that I did in my opening editorial uh, to say that's a great example as well. We weren't there. I don't know. I wish Len was still around to uh, really, you know, give us a clearer definition of what the marching orders from Roy were and how much he feels uh, or felt 
that Roy contributed to the creation of Wolverine. We're not going to know. We're really not going to know. Uh, we can only go back to previous quotes from uh, all involved, including Roy, including Herb Trimpey, including, uh, of course, Len Wein. But it, it just bugs me. And it's so unnecessary because uh, n nobody has to plead the case for Roy Thomas's contributions to the Marvel Universe. Or the DC Universe, for that matter. Um, I don't know. I really don't know. Someone reminded me that when the uh, the um, Black Adam movie came out, uh, Adam Smasher was a co-creation of Jerry Ordway and uh, and Roy Thomas uh, in Infinity Inc. Um, and yeah, they got checks. You know, uh, not huge checks, but they got something. Uh, you know, a Adam Smasher could have been it could have been another character in that um, Black Adam movie, but they did use him. Um, but yeah, and again, I am so for these guys getting properly compensated I don't know I'm shaking my head maybe you are as well I hope at least you were found the uh, the conversation I had with uh, Dr. Flores and uh, Mr. Thomas interesting and you can decide for yourselves um, I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Word Balloon uh, we got great stuff coming up in April uh, as we begin April and this is no April Fool uh, program as you heard but lots of other great stuff and I can tell you in the weeks ahead uh, we're going to have new conversations with Brian Hitch and Sanford Green, among others. And uh, it's going to be great. Of course, Discovery is coming back, Star Trek. And uh, we'll talk about the first couple episodes of that next week, probably next Monday, because I want Mitch, Wayne, and Franco all involved and give them a chance to, uh, to watch the shows. I mean, Mitch is going to be busy with a gamer convention that he's doing uh, that, that weekend. <laughs> so... Until then, thanks for listening. Until next time, Word Balloon is copyright feature of Shaky Productions. Copyright 2024. Stay safe, stay happy, stay healthy.